Cool. All right, we are at the top of the hour. Um, welcome to Packet Capture in the DPDK. Uh, we will have some Q&A breaks along the way, so feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A panel. Uh, we will not answer them uh, real time, but Stephen will have a couple of breaks along the way to address any cues that you bring up. Um, any other housekeeping that we need to address? I don't think so. Uh, with that, take it away, Stephen. Okay, thank you very much. Um, hi, uh, my name is Stephen Heminger. I'm located here south of Portland, Oregon. Um, it's kind of strange having a virtual conference. I've had uh, many virtual events and too many meetings, but this is the first actual virtual conference that I've been presenting at. So if things go wrong, give me a little break. I may have to shuffle around a bit. And I promise not have to go into network deep dive on what's going on. Um, let's see here. So this is what I'm going to cover today. I'm going to go a little background about uh, DVDK and so on, because I, given this event, I'm not sure that everybody has a really full knowledge of what it is and, and so on. Um, I'm going to go about the existing packet capture that's in the DVDK and uh, a better tool that I've been working on and where I want to take it and what sort of contributions would be really helpful. So, so first of all, um, a little background about me. I've actually went back and looked and uh, I've been in computer networking for 30 years now. So I guess I'm officially gray beard. Um, my first patches were actually back when uh, BSD 4.2 to fix TCP retransmit. So um, it goes quite back away. Um, in the recent past, I've been a major Linux networking contributor. Um, I took over the Linux bridge for quite a number of years. Uh, now pass the maintainership of that off to some good folks at Cumulus. I run a network emulator that's used a lot for testing, emulating network delays in Linux. Uh, built the TCP congestion control framework that is used to support multiple congestion control algorithms in Linux. And that's actually been used and ported by a number of academics people elsewhere. And it's actually in BSD as well now. I am the IP2 route maintainer. Um, so I, you have questions or patches for IP route 2, get a hold of me. Um, with the data plane development kit, I was one of the early contributors. I was at a startup called Viata, and we worked with Intel to do one of the initial versions even before it was publicly available. And I'm a member of the technical board of the DBDK. And yes, that picture on the right is me. I don't, I think I was scuba diving in Hawaii, and that's a really stupid sock puppet <laughs> shark <laughs> photographer took. I just couldn't resist putting it in. So a little background on the DPDK. The guy on the right is um, Vinky Venkatsama. He was the original father of the DPDK. Uh, he passed away two years ago, so I always like to remember him. Uh, the DPDK project started in Intel, and it's now a multiple company, multiple uh, contributor open source project. We're governed by the Linux Foundation. We have a very active community. Uh, most of the contributors currently are from the hardware vendors because all the hardware vendors want support for their hardware and their NICs and their um, infrastructure. Uh, it's used by many open source projects. Two of the biggest that people probably know of is FDIO's VPP project and open vSwitch. And almost every network equipment vendor uses DPDK in some form or other. Um, I'm sure Riverbed does. I know Cisco, Juniper, Palo Alto, you know, you name it, they use it. 
um, and we get feedback from them um, on a semi-regular basis. So one of the questions people often ask is why do we, what's the point of the DPDK? Uh, the real motivation was that for performance. So Intel looked at the performance of uh, Linux for networking and said, look, we're not getting anywhere near what we can and we can't hit the hit these networking, uh, we can't use software for networking like we want. So the Linux kernel, I always use a rule of thumb um, on most current generation processors, you can basically process a million packets a second per core. Um, now, sure, the, if you tune it, use different things, you can bump that up to seven or eight, it's possible, but the baseline is about one million. Um, DVDK, without too much of a stretch, you can hit line rate on a 10 gig NIC with a single core, which is 14 million packets a second. So that's more than 10x difference. So that's really the reason that everybody's using it for these network appliances. And the other motivation is the development overhead for putting something in the Linux curl is hard. Um, software companies often don't want to have to deal with GPL license issues. They don't want to have to collaborate and push their code upstream because it may be difficult or it may be uh, poorly written or they don't want to take feedback. And lastly, the Linux kernel ecosystem is often um, working with Linux distributions. So Red Hat, SUSE, Ubuntu, and collaborating with those is uh, something that is more difficult for the network appliance vendors to deal with. So usually they roll their own, which leads to other issues. So the DBDK architecture, why it's different than Linux kernels and FreeBSD kernels is everything is de uses dedicated per CPU threads. Most of the algorithms and internals are lock free. What that means is in a kernel world, you basically want to provide application interface. So you want it to provide thread safety. And this it's kind of like the Wild West. It's up to you to control the resources in your own application. And all the APIs are batch APIs. And the memory is set up as direct pin memory uh, with direct DMA to user space. And the DPDK also has a very large number of network libraries that you can use to build your application. So you have hash tables, route tables, software crypto offload, uh, support for event devices on ARM and other processors, and a whole, I can't, I mean, I, I pulled up a slide that showed it, it was just so confusing, I decided to skip it, of all the many, many libraries that DPDK has. So you have, basically, it's just like, Java or C library, you have a huge set of libraries you can use. The typical DPDK application is very simple. Internally, it's basically just a packet loop of pull packets with a uh, receive burst, does something to the packets or holds on to them and then transmits a bunch of packets out. So that's basically the core mechanism for how DPDK works. So what does this do? Well, this creates a kind of uh, confusing model for people that are coming in from Linux or BSD or Windows. Like because of the DVDK and how it does hardware assignment, there is no network devices that are visible to the application directly. So the first question I always hear from DVDK people is where's my E0? Like where's my network device? And then the next one that comes up is how can I use this? There's no TCP sockets. So the DPDK is, a, is not a network stack. It's a packet processing engine, which means that if you want a TCP, you've got to put one, find one and put it in yourself. Use a bunch of other projects that base off of DPDK that provide TCP. And the last one, which is kind of what this talk is about is there's no standard tools. So 
how do I do packet capture and how do I see what is going on in my application? So I thought I'd take a break and if there's any questions about uh, DVDK and general DVDK stuff, I cover them at this point. We got one in the chat. Uh, any chance this is compatible with Moloch? I do not know what Moloch is. It is a full packet capture, large scale open source index packet capture and search. I Google. suspect not, um, but I'd have to look at it. Okay. Um, Any other questions? All right. Okay. I will go a little bit on um, why I got into this later. Um, so there's, there is a, I'm going to get to the next part. I'll talk about that. So the existing DPK, um, there's a standalone existing packet capture. Oh, all right. This, this what I wanted to talk about the use cases for packet capture. So that really there's three use cases that we see in the DPDK for packet capture. One is the standalone existing DPDK support which is actually in the current versions of libpcap. And that's for the case of either directly with one of the Wireshark or T-Shark or Thumbcap tools. You want to say, I've got a dedicated interface. I want to suck packets. I want to analyze those packets. Um, there's also two or three other projects that work that way. That means you've got basically a dedicated, maybe a span port or something you're trying to analyze or work with. I'm not gonna cover that case because I think that that one's actually um, handled pretty well already. Um, the second one is internal capture inside an application. Now this is the case of you have something like open vSwitch or uh, VPP or, um, with Juniper's contrail and inside that application, there may be some command that you can do to capture packets at some point in the packet pipeline. Um, I'm not gonna directly address that one, but I think that the tools that I wanna provide could be useful for those applications. Um, obviously, you know, something that's big and coming from a, a network equipment vendor probably has a lot more of their own specifics that may not make this directly appropriate. And the last one is the, the use case I'm mostly targeting is I've got some appliance or some application and I want to see what's going on on the packets in and out of that application. Um, this is just like all the other talks you'll see here where I'm running a web server or I'm running something and I want to see the packets. And this is the equivalent of let's snoop on ETH0 in my application. So the existing DVDK packet capture that was done works by having a primary application and the secondary application. So the primary application is whatever your application is normally running. Typically, the DVDK people use an application called test PMD, which is just a transmit receive, but it could be a packet forwarder. It could be anything, OBS. Um, it works by having callbacks that are opt-in in the application that are registered. So basically, on every receive and transmit, a callback is run for the packets that are going to be handled. And that those packets are queued to a ring buffer that's in shared memory. And then there's a secondary process called pdump, which pulls the packets from the ring buffer and forwards them to the DVDK uh, PCAP driver to then be, get recorded in a file. So that's pretty much how they the existing P DVDK PDump tool works. Um, and it's straightforward and it's there now. There are a couple of issues with that. Uh, first of all, every, if you look around, you'll see that several people have measured performance. I was hoping to put up performance slides and I had a bunch of issues with getting it running. So 
but basically when you run this, the overhead of copying and snooping is causing significant drops. And also you can't possibly get all the packets from a 10 gig interface into a file that you want. Another one is the functionality of this tool is much less than you're used to. And lastly, the user interface of it is a DPDK style interface, which may or may not be, it's fine if you're a DPDK developer, but I don't really love it. And if you're used to using other packet capture tools, that's not really what you want. So from the performance point of view, the first big performance hit is the number of copies. So every packet that comes in, in the callback, gets copied to a new MBOF. So you got one copy there. Then the secondary process picks it up and decides that you're using the standard PCAP output routines that do an F-write, and the F-write causes a copy to a standard I-O buffer. Actually, there's you know, one for the header and one for the data. And then that packet standard I.O. does a syscall write to the kernel, and then the kernel writes it to disk. So for every packet coming in, there's four copies, and most of those are not even batched. So no wonder we're not able to keep up with line rate the way we want. And the biggest issues that the time stamping is done in the secondary process. So the timestamp is actually the timestamp that it was written to the file, not the timestamp it was received. And if you're doing any kind of analysis of when packets arrive or what's going on, that's the wrong end of the hose to be timestamping. Um, and internally, we use VLANs for a bunch of things. And because VLANs are stripped, usually in the DPDK, and in the metadata of the MBUF, the VLAN is actually lost. So there's no VLAN information. The PDUP right now uh, doesn't have any information about multiple interfaces and, or direction. So you basically have a single interface only and you don't even know, was this a send or receive? Um, if you're doing any kind of forwarding what you really want to know is uh, the packet arrived here, and here's what I sent out on another interface. And there is no facility for capture filters. So you can't just say, I only want to see uh, this packet, and I only want to see IPv6 multicast. None of that, no capture filters exist in, in anywhere in this architecture. And uh, you're getting full packets only. So especially if you're using bigger packet sizes or you have restrictions like where you want to basically only capture the headers so that you don't um, leak customer data, you have that problem as well. And with all that, I wondered if, does anybody actually use the existing DVDK dump? Or is it just something that was done as an experiment? <laughs> I don't well, I'll go on. I'll back to it. I have a question about it. Um, so, are you saying that this is you know this is what is available with the framework, and but you don't have to use it? Someone could write their own. Yeah. Okay. okay. This is the tool that's under app pdump in DBDK. Okay. Um, and what I did decide to do was say, okay, it's kind of like, if I consider that the equivalent of TCP dump, well, what would I do in the more modern world, right? Um, and I called it, I made up the name DBDK Shark. I'll get back to the naming later, but that was just my name for it. Um, I like the primary secondary process model because it let us run an application to look at packets that's separate from the primary application. Um, and so that was a good thing of PDUMP. That was about the only thing I kept. But I wanted more performance and features. And this really started from an effort where we were, uh, we were building DVDK applications. And 
some of the application has built-in packet capture now. And what could I do to take some of those features and get them upstream and into DBK? And started back in 2019, but still want to get it going. Um, everybody knows this year has been kind of hell and getting, getting things done has been a lot harder than I expected. So I'll get back to that. So what I decided to do was build a tool that has as close to the existing dump cap tool in, deep, in Wireshark API. So you basically say DPDA Shark and it has the same kinds of interface as existing tools. Um, and I've also stubbed out some of the options that aren't fully there yet, but it's going to have them. Um, so the usage is pretty much the same. There's nothing that's going to be a big shock to anybody. And the to get around kind of the ETH zero whatever model, it uses the same kind of idea of having a list of interfaces. So if you've ever used any of the tools, Wireshark or command line, you say dash D and it lists the interfaces. In this case, we're listing the interfaces that we've discovered in the DBDK. Um, and likewise, it uses the same kind of default mechanisms that Dubcap does, where in the second example, I'm capturing 10 packets. Um, it chooses the first interface to do it. If you don't give it another interface, it chooses the first interface. It does kind of the, let's do the same, same defaults. And likewise, it uses the same kind of mechanism for choosing the output files. So there, the idea was to have, let's have no surprises and just make things work the same as much as possible. Um, as far as capture filters, I would, I want capture filters, but I don't want to re, I certainly didn't want to reinvent all the string parsing and converting strings to BPF. So it uses the existing uh, lib pcap string to CB, PF conversion uses a library or functions that convert classic BPF to eBPF. Um, and this is based on the same thing that's done actually today in the Linux kernel. And I contacted the maintainers of that, and they had no problem with me reusing that code for that. Um, because the Linux kernel is GPL licensed and DBDK is BSD licensed, I had to make sure that that was okay. And DBDK has actually an eBPF engine inside with full JIT support. So once we are able to get the capture filter converted into eBPF, it's not, a, it's not hard at all to say run an eBPF filter on this burst of packets and decide which ones you want. For DPK Shark, I wanted to address some of the other things as well. Um, so for the timestamp, we stamp the packets as soon as we get them in the callback. And there's discussion of some devices have ability to do it in hardware. To be honest, the DBK hardware timestamp is a bit of a uh, moving target at this point because only Mellanox supports it in a unit that is actually going to be convertible to the values we want in software. Um, so we need better hardware support from some of the other vendors to really make it usable. As far as VLANs, it's not hard to basically detect that the VLAN has been offloaded and reinsert it so that you see the packet as it was on the wire when you get the capture. Um, we're switching over, to, it switched over to using PCAP NG, which I'll get to in a second. So we can support multiple interfaces and tag the correct interfaces. We can tag, track the direction of the packet and we can actually record the queue the packet came in on with DBDK. Uh, this is important because a lot of the problems we run into with customers or hardware or whatever software are problems with RSS, where a customer complains about a performance problem, 
and it really turns out that all the packets are arriving on one queue and we have to discover that and diagnose that issue. Uh, as far as performance, the, the big thing was how to adjust the copies. So, um, so the first way to avoid the copy from the original MBUF to the new one is actually not called external, it's called attached MBUFs. So we create an MBUF that points to the other one. Um, we can do this on transmit, on receive, it's gotta be an option because a lot of the upper stacks are not really able to deal with the reference counting of the MBUFs. So until we sort out those issues, save one copy on transmit, but we still end up with one on receive. As far as avoiding standard IO, I wrote a new PCAP and G writer library that avoids going through standard IO. So we save that copy. Um, and to, for copies three and four, um, want to minimize the number of system calls to write a packet. So using write B is in there now. I am experimenting with using async IO in the new Linux IOU ring, which will let us avoid, so we can do zero copy from the user space packet we have into the kernel. Um, it might also be possible to even avoid the file system copy by using direct IO. And this matters because especially if you've got a high speed box with uh, NVMe, you can go directly to the NVMe. So there would end up, my goal is to get to the point where we can have a single copy from the received packet in memory to the NVMe device. So to, to do the PCAP NG, um, I initially built a version of PCAP NG that was used internally for projects. The first version of this, um, I took that PCAP NG library and buried it inside the command utility. And the feedback I got from several people was this would generally be useful, useful even outside this. So GPDK has libraries that all start with RTAE underscore. So I turned that into a PCAP NG writer library that's going to be in the DPK with this submission. So it has a bunch of interfaces that let you open a file and put the headers on, add interfaces, and dump packets. Um, I think this would generally be useful for applications that outside of even DPDK that, don't, that just want to write data that don't want to end up sucking in all of PCAP to do that or trying to export from other things. Uh, if we had a better library, it's not that I have any less on my code. I'm very happy to use a different one if people have a good way, standard way of formatting it. Um, so what the plan is, is um, to submit this I was going to submit it for the current release, which is 2011, but there's so many other things going in there and so many moving targets that it makes sense to put it into 2103. The CBPF to EBPF converter is still not stable enough to be used for filtering, so that needs some work. Uh, and this is new code. It definitely needs more performance tuning. There's many options possibilities to do more batching and to get a lot more uh, performance out of this. And likewise, the IOU ring stuff. And there's a bunch of things that I also have a laundry list of metadata that I want to get in there, especially for diagnosing these RSS kind of problems where we know the packet. We also want to know whatever other bits were in that packet because if you've ever tried to diagnose things in the cloud, you often can't do it live. You get a ca ca packet capture or some other record that was done later, and you want as much information about that packet with the packet as it sits. Um, I have some questions about all this. The first one is, how important is it 
to support older Linux distros. So a lot of what we do with Linux support in Azure, we have a lot of support on older Linux distros that creates a lot of work. So we have customers still running on Rails 6. Um, this, I don't know that, and network equipment vendors that based on older Linux distros. So what this means is it makes it hard to do things like the IOU ring that is a new feature in Linux. So how important is it to actually support really old Linux versions? Uh, the EPDK also supports FreeBSD. Pre I have not, there's nothing about this that right now wouldn't work on the FreeBSD version. I haven't tested it or spent the effort to make that real. Um, as we go forward though, it would, the question is what APIs would be helpful on BSD or does anybody actually use DVDK on BSD in their products? Um, there's a new, now DVDK supports DVDK on Windows. It's very much a, a new architecture and a new version. Um, there's nothing specific about this right now that couldn't be done on the Windows, but like again, there's a lot of basically architecture porting that wouldn't be needed to make it run well on Windows. Um, the APIs that I've done for the packet capture are pretty much inside this P Shark, uh, DVDK Shark utilities. Um, there's nothing that says those couldn't be more exposed as a tracing API in general. So we have the, the PCAP and G library, but maybe there would be useful trace point or integration with the trace point facility in the DPDK somehow. And looking at the PCAP and G standard, there was recently put in packet ID and going along with the tracing it would be very useful if you were putting in trace points to also have a packet ID with that tracing API, but that needs some, how would you like create a packet ID off a, a memory pointer or would it make sense? Um, do we you know, do the kernel trick of, well, I don't want to expose actual addresses in user space or in this case, addresses in the application, do we hash it somehow or something? to create a packet ID. So there's a, there's an opportunity, a research opportunity there, but it's definitely a question of is trade-off of, is it, would it be valuable or is it just something that is a wild idea? Um, the other open question is, how could this be better integrated with Wireshark? Right now, this is just a capture utility. I could see where it might be useful to be able to say, um, make it more seamless that you could just use T-Shark and it would capture live off the DBDK application. The problem here is actually not so much software technical. There's a whole bunch of library packaging questions like how would you get this version to talk with that version and um, public APIs and so on. So I think it could be more integrated, but um, it's hard to integrate between two projects when the API is not fundamentally stable yet. Um, and so why am I here on all this? Well, the first thing is, obvious thing is I want some feedback. Um, I'm using the shark name. That was kind of a recent change I decided to do on this, basically because I wanted to tell, give the indication to users that that's what this was trying to do and where it was headed. Um, I'm not sure about the long-term direction of all this. Um, this is basically me following through and ex submitting upstream something that was useful. Um, if it's not, I don't want to create yet another sample application that nobody uses. And going along with that, I really like some feedback on what features people really would like to see, what, what's most important. Um, and I'd also like real world, more real world testers, contributors, and maybe even someone if they're really super motivated on this to take over maintaining it and owning it. Um, 
because right now the DVDK community, when we're kind of focused on ourselves, we don't say as we don't have user feedback. And I really want user feedback to form the tools and make them as useful as possible. And with that, um, oops, how do I do it for time? That was 35 minutes, that's not too bad. I'd like to get some questions and uh, give right. some feedback. There is first question in the chat, are the libraries compatible with Golang? Um, there's, it's possible people have actually used DPDK from Go and Rust. Um, I think there's some standing, you may have to do some of the, you know, Go calls C to make it work. Um, but I am not a Golang expert. All right. Uh, next question, DPDK versus P4, different hammers or hammer versus screwdriver? Um, so it's kind of more like the difference between um, language versus library. So P4 is a language. There is an implementation now of P4 to DPDK pipeline that is in the current 2011 version. So Constantine from Intel has submitted and it's integrated ability to basically run a P4 program that then gets run against the DPDK, a DPDK pipeline. Um, so that is a useful area I haven't explored, but we could certainly, this would actually work with that. You could actually snoop packets off that pipeline at the beginning and end. Um, and this would be an example of where putting trace points in would be useful, right? You'd like to be able to get packets at certain stages of your P4 program. All right. Uh, I know you did mention something about performance at the top. There is a question on performance um, for the- I don't have the good numbers. I tried to run them and I wasn't satisfied with what I got. I did, you know, the basic one is you you could, you lose, you were losing about 10% um, overhead when you were uh, capturing and it should be much better. Um, it really, there's a whole nother set of questions about how does it go against different sizes and cores. And I was trying to get that picture and couldn't get it done or do the slides. It was one or the other. Do you have any ballpark numbers against say a 10 no, gig source? No, I don't, source? and I okay. don't want to say. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, Fair enough. Uh, what is the quickest way to get started with DPDK Sharp? Um, the easiest way is uh, send me an email and I will send you the link when I when the submission goes out, which is probably going to be like November, early November. Um, All right. Uh, and I'd also like, it, even if people's feedback was, I read the man, I want more on the man page, I need to know how to do this or something that would be very useful. All right. Uh, just my comment on, on the name, I think, T-Shark and other utilities, they uh, ride on top of dump cap. Is that right? I right. think. And then TCP dump. So maybe DP, DPDK dump. Um, yeah, maybe I'll do that. Um, <laughs> I, don't know. But I was trying to avoid getting conflicted with the existing P dump. That was why. Right, was right. Uh, I can read the questions. How accurate is the okay. capture? Um, that's really a performance question. Um, so the we're getting the timestamp when the packet is pulled off the hardware so you're still going to have whatever latency you've got between the receive descriptor ring or the transmit descriptor ring of the hardware so that depends a lot on how many descriptors you have and what your traffic rate is um, as far as development environment pretty and pretty much any modern linux distro works um, to be honest, a lot of the, the, the main focus has been basically Debian-based distros like uh, Debian or Ubuntu or uh, Red Hat, um, but we do have people using other distros. Um, okay. All right. Uh, if anybody answered. has good DPDK capture works as a name too. Um, I intentionally, I've dealt with enough tools that I've learned that don't build the name into the tool as a really hard thing because it will get changed at the last minute. Um, one of my early life things was at a database company that decided to change the name of the release 
uh, a week before it was going to come out. Uh, so I'm very familiar with not building the name in. Um, my goal is to be able to handle like 10 gig without packet drops going to um, fast memory. Uh, so if you're going to something that can keep up with that, um, so either uh, a rotating store or some short burst or some other um, high speed NVMe device, that should be good. Uh, will packet drops be counted? Um, I've got some counters in there in terms of what didn't make it into the ring. Uh, counting drops is hard because there's so many places that can be dropped and having diagnosed problems, you it's always the one you didn't find. So there will probably be cases where you also have to look at the hardware counters where the hardware counters are separate from the capture counters, if that makes sense. So you'll have cases where the packet got dropped because the receiver ring got full. Um, and that gets reported only at the end in the interface stats block, which I'm supporting, but not in the middle of the capture. Um, as far as between capture um, block frames, I have a version that had that in there. It didn't seem that Wireshark was actually supporting that now. Um, but I would like to, if one that's supported, I'll put that back in. The other one is there's some of the metadata that's being put in the packets now are things that Wireshark, at least in the current version, is not displaying. Um, so there's kind of a chicken and egg problem, right? You can, the standard leads, um, this is actually implementing things in the standard PCAP and G standard that there isn't code to display it in Wireshark. And I will investigate Wulock. I wanted a tool like that. Um, and it would be useful to be able to have that. If we would probably keep caps, we can do the code. <laughs> sure.